the April edition of MyTechU. Uh, we are uh, excited to offer a uh, preview of uh, Tech Pulse of a Tech Pulse presentation um, that will be a little different in person because uh, we're actually going to show uh, the Rubik's cube. Um, but uh, I'm pretty excited to announce. So Michael Frasconi is going to lead this presentation today. Um, and Michael is, uh, if you've ever met Michael, he is extremely passionate about uh, process. And uh, one of the things about process is that sometimes people don't quite connect the dots of how process can actually uh, help you be more efficient or streamlined uh, at solving problems. And uh, so what, what uh, the title of this you know, um, webinar today or the MyTechU session is, Can a Rubik's Cube uh, Actually Help You Improve Your Business? And um, Michael has actually documented the process for how to solve a Rubik's Cube. So I don't know if those of you who ever remember a Rubik's Cube, I'm sure you do, and never either solved it or never solved it, there's actually a process that you can follow. And, uh, and so Michael's gone through the effort to, to do that. And so he's going to talk about process, talk about how this can relate to your business. So um, for the next uh, 40, 45 minutes, we're going to talk you through this. And if there's any questions, by all means, please um, uh, add them to uh, go use the chat or the question panel on your uh, control panel. And uh, we look forward to connecting with you uh, today as well as um, uh, Tech Pulse next week. So, Michael, uh, take it away. Explain how a Rubik's Cube can improve <laughs> our business. Okay. Thanks, Nate. Um, all right. Thank you, everyone. Um, as Nate said, I am the Process Improvement Director here at MyTech. And what I've put together is um, – an overview of our strategy and within our strategy I have devised a process for solving the Rubik's Cube that I'm delivering to staff and anyone who's interested and it's basically to deliver a message. Um, one of the reasons why I picked the Rubik's Cube is because well number one I love puzzles, I love putting things in order so that's probably why I am a, passion, a passionate person about process anyway. Um, so what we've done in the last year and a half since I started here at MyTech we have collaborated on most of our key processes by now. Uh, we have engaged and collaborated on our finance processes, our procurement process, our sales to project development process, our new hire process, and our new client process. And those processes are continuously changing. And later in the, in the webinar, I will show you just um, how some of those processes look. Um, <clears throat> what I'd like to do then, just is to get started, is to kind of go over how we're going to cover this. It's really going to be quite simple. Um, let me back up. Sorry about that. We're just going to cover our process strategy and how it fits in the overall, um, uh, how process fits into MyTech's overall strategy. We'll talk about our process engagement, what that looks like, and I will uh, wrap up with a short, a brief demo of the tool we use to capture our processes. Um, that will um, fit it all together and then I can show you what I've done with the Rubik's Cube. But again, the question is why a Rubik's Cube? I have the question in here or a knockoff because when I first decided to use the Rubik's Cube, I had to learn how to uh, resolve it and then document it. And I've done it, uh, I first did all the process documentation and collection around the Rubik's Cube, so I bought a Rubik's Cube. When I went to buy them in bulk, I found out how expensive it would be, and we ended up with some knockoffs. So I did make some adjustments to the instructions accordingly. Um, <clears throat> so what we have here, the reason why I chose the Rubik's Cube is because it's a perfect example of process. It, it takes um, a cube that, if you look at that picture, it's kind of chaotic, just like business. And then when you apply the process to it, you get the expected results every single time. But in addition to just it being an example and used a way to explain strategy, it achieves these three outcomes. The first thing that it does is it explains our strategy, as I just said. It also ex explains the importance of compliance. If you comply to the process and do it a certain way, you will have the expected result that you plan for. And in the second piece that it achieves is when we have our staff <laughs> solving Rubik's Cubes and we have a fun lunch and learn or a meeting to, to do some coaching and training, it actually is teaching them how to follow all of our process documentation because I'm using our process documentation in the same way. So then they start to make the connection. In our, and you'll see later that our process document output can be in multiple different types of media, whether it's a Word document, Excel, or um, on HTML in a website. Um, and I'll get to that later. 
The third thing that I like to always in involve about process is that it engages everyone. It gets everyone thinking and talking about process. And one of our corporate values is create fun and a little weirdness. I thought it was great to put that in there because it is, it's a fun thing to do. It's a great exercise. I've had tremendous feedback already on, on the several individuals I've had testing this process for me. And it's, it's, it's generating quite a buzz. I'm going to go on to talk about uh, the other strategic tools we use on top of that here at MyTech. So the things we use that drive all of this within the company, of course, is our mission, vision, and values, with one of the values I just mentioned. Um, our vision is actually to um, provide the best, IT the best IT experience in North America. So our processes are directly related to that because the customer experience is a result of our processes, and I'll, I'll show some of that later. Our Make a Difference, that is a, uh, a book and a uh, workshop that we do to identify different personality types. Some people use Myers-Briggs, some people use the DISC analysis, but we use Make a Difference, and it really does drive and help the way we communicate internally. Another very important strategic tool we're using and that we've started using this past year is uh, the book Traction by Gina Wickman. This is um, using a uh, um, very, uh, very directed approach at uh, improving everything we do in the organization, and Gina Wickman will be our guest speaker at Tech Pulse um, to learn more about that. The last two items on this list are really more near and dear to my heart within process. We have ITIL. If any of you have heard of ITIL, Information Technology Infrastructure Library, it is really all about IT service delivery um, and it is heavily focused in process. So my job as the process director is all about process. How do we drive it? How do we um, engage with it? And how do we improve it and keep it living, breathing, and compliant? The tools I use in order to do that are listed here, Excel in order and SharePoint. Excel will be what I will be demonstrating um, at, the end of the, at the end of this PowerPoint. So really, between ITIL and process, they both, I mean, ITIL promotes your end-to-end -end process management, and if processing isn't consistently followed, this is a concept of ITIL, if the process is not consistently followed, you're going to have different results. And the whole point is, is to have expected results that you plan for. And of course, again, our processes directly impact the customer experience, just as part of our corporate value. Um, <clears throat> what I'm going to do now is get into a little bit more on the Rubik's Cube, right? So the whole point is, and this is it in a nutshell, here is the strategy. If we stick to the process, we can get the results we want. Now, it will consistently produce the same results, but it doesn't mean we can't change it. And I will talk to the compliance and the, the cons, uh, continual improvement on how our tool lets us do that. But once, the whole point is when you've decided and agreed on this process from end to end, you will get the results you plan for. Okay, so that's really it in a nutshell. The, one of the benefits of it, and I always like to use this slide, is because this is where many businesses today suffer, or they, they at least find it very challenging to, to get out of these operational silos, and, and management is heavily dependent upon to communicate between those silos. And really, with end-to-end -end processes, you're, you're creating a transparency that there's, there's, everyone becomes more aware of what they're doing and how it impacts the organization overall. Um, so it's, it's critical that process is, is managed that way. Now, one of the other slides I always like to use in, in the um, discussion around process is how it's really quite simply done when you're talking about the basics of process management um, in using the tool we use and the methodology we use here at MyTech. It's really just four simple ways to approach it. We start out with discovery workshops, right? What are those? Discovery workshops, they can be meetings, discussions, um, uh, collaborative emails. Really, it's your information gathering time. It's, it's about getting all the players involved, which, in, which then will result in better buy-in. You'll get more understanding between departments. That's one of the, the fundamental things that starts to erode away at those silos. When you have completed your discovery workshops, or at least when you're in them and they're ongoing, you begin to collaborate the process and build your documentation. Now, <clears throat> documentation isn't going to be just something you print out and put on a shelf. You want to make sure that it's living and breathing, and I'll keep reiterating that through because it's critical that it's accessible and it's not just something that you say you have. 
Um, but once you have done the discoveries and you start documenting, then you start looking to compliance. Um, in compliance, you're going to find more, again, more buy-in. If you include the people that are doing the process, you'll get more buy-in from them and you'll have um, compliance comes by more naturally, uh, which you will see and it's very evident once you have the processes defined. The idea is, is once you've achieved compliance or you're in compliance, you work to continuously improve the process. You're always going to want to keep it on the forefront and, and measure and look at it and review and look for exceptions and work through those so that your process is never stagnant. It should never be. It should always be moving and, and breathing. And one of the things that I talk about in when you're building documentation and there's a caveat that people tend to try to resolve every single issue in their organization at the get-go. And that could be very uh, time consuming and very difficult. The, the way I approach it here is we start out at the high level. You want to um, develop and increase the detail as, you're, as you continue to work and engage with the process. So you, you start out documenting basically, if it's new, you would say, well, how do we do it today? And while you do that, you're going to probably find a few minor fixes along the way just to make minor adjustments and improvements. But you start at that level, you get the capture of what it is as is, and you work yourself down into medium level as you continue to improve. And then you get into the finer points and even down to even screenshots and field names and so forth of whatever system or spreadsheet you want people to be engaged with within the process. But you start at the high level and agree it's going to go from here to here to here to here and, and so forth. Um, <clears throat> The last two pieces of that cycle is really the, very important, and these things make everyone trust the process. If you make it accessible and everyone is accountable in your organization, if you, if you have made the strategic commitment to, to be process-centric and follow the, your guidelines for, and you expect your staff to do it, everyone should do it. Everyone, there should be no exception. So everyone should be accountable and everyone needs to be aware that everyone is accountable. The way to develop trust in the process output or the documentation that you have or the instruction for your staff is when you do need to make changes that they collaborate well and that you have rapid deployment of those changes because the faster you get them in, the more engaged people stay engaged. Okay. Now, <clears throat> I have a, a demonstration I'm going to do um, with our tool just to show you how we capture a process. And then beyond the demo, I'm going to show you some of our finished processes and how they look, especially the one about the Rubik's Cube, because I think that one everyone can relate to. And before I start on the demo, I'm going to explain how the tool is basically broken down. And if you think of processes this way while you're watching me collect and build a, a demonstration process, it's quite simple. You define a process, and within a process, there are several stages, it could be one or more stages of work that need to be performed. At a stage level, so a stage, think of it like entering a sales order. So if you have a stage of work, if somebody needs to enter a sales order in a system, they may have several tasks to complete. Maybe the first task is go and look up if customer is in system. Is customer in system, then enter, <clears throat> enter order and so forth. You know, there might be a couple of things they have to do. And the roles in the system we use are assigned to the stages of work. So when a stage begins, that role who started it must finish it by completing all the tasks in the stage. I don't want to get any more complicated than that because as you see when I build the process, I, when I build a process in the tool, it's really quite simple. And I always like this quote by by Albert Einstein, I think it's interesting that it, it, it speaks to me and it speaks to process. If you can't picture it, it's harder to understand, of course. So I'm going to just back out of here for a minute and I'm going to go ahead and open up um, the proce our process management tool. This is called Excel in Order. I hope you all can see my screen. This is just um, a, a landing page that will allow you to get to there web uh, YouTube video page and get instructions and help and so forth. When you, if you were to use this tool, I, I'm, although we can resell this, I, I would recommend doing your research and um, getting a tool that could provide you the same functionality. Um, if you're interested in this one, I can take that offline another time. 
But this one is my preference. I've been using this tool for about 12 years and uh, watching it develop over the years has been pretty exciting. One of the things that we'll do, I'm just going to show you basically what's going to happen when we want to collect a process and start to document it. And then when I'm done with the demo, I will show you what some of that output will look like. So I'm just going to open up the software as if I'm a brand new user, never have used it before. I'm going to create a business model. And so I'm going to call this one, um, you know, I'll just call it my tech test, right, or something. You just create the business model, and I'm going to open it up, and I'm just going to create a couple of things that's going to help me, that will help me develop further processes. Number one is some user notes that I'll use in the system. If you notice the interface, it's very Word, it's very much like uh, Microsoft Office. So you've got your ribbon bar at the top with all of your selections and you can do all different kinds of notes in your system, whether you're going to do aggregates or hyperlinks or just um, some simple instructions. And which I usually do when I train folks with this product and when I use it, I actually just start with a description note and an instruction note. Um, and that will make sense in just a minute. The other thing that I do would like to show is the fact that you can add and customize icons. Back to the point about if, if I can't picture it, I can't understand it. You'll notice in here that we have lots of available icons to make the imagery very visual and it actually allows people to um, select and make their process look like it's very customized, right? I'm just going to make sure those moved over. I have to let it select. So you can customize icons and add your own, uh, which I do quite frequently. I tend to use for our ERP system and things like that. It's just going to take a minute. There's about a thousand icons in there that I'm copying over. And this is just for a brand new model. Once you do that, you're done. And now you can create a process. So what I'm going to do is just add a process and I'm going to call this one um, credit request. So a client might ask for a credit request. Like what happens if a client asks for a credit request? So all I've done right now is just define my process. I'm going to add some roles before I start my process. So I'm just going to go um, here and just say maybe there's a credit clerk involved. And this is where I can use that process, the discovery. Um, phase of step one of those four steps. So I could be sitting in a room or just going and talking with individuals and say, who is involved? Who are the players? One's going to be a credit clerk. Maybe it's all staff. Any employee could receive the request, right? Maybe there's a team lead. Maybe there's a, a manager that needs to approve. So we'll just start with those four roles. You can always add them as you build. Um, I tend to just start pre-building a few things just to make the process go a little faster, but you can see just how easy it is here just to start building. So I'm going to go ahead and back to my process. I'm going to open it up in my design page, and you'll notice what I've got is like a gridded piece of paper, and then I have all my ribbon bars up here of change, and I can add and go from there. There's two tabs here. I can either build it in a list format and just start adding stages here and just say, receive request, um, maybe the next one is um, approve, deny request, and maybe there's um, email credit memo or enter credit memo. It doesn't even matter in which order I put them in. You can drag and drop. You can see that it's just a really easy design tool. This tool is based on a business architecture so that when you start connecting things and putting flows to them, it will know exactly how things are supposed to work. So basically, I can build it in a list pattern and start putting in my tasks under the, the stages, or I could do it all in a drawing. So either way I enter it, I can the information will update on either side. I tend to like to draw, so I'm going to use some shortcuts in there. A process has to have a start and a stop. I can even customize these for visual. I, I, in my processes, I usually have this look like a go from a stoplight, and this looks like a stop. It's just whatever you're comfortable with, and you can again change the icons here to say to look like whatever you want. Um, but I'm just going to stay with the default just to quickly show you some functionality here. So I'm going to oops I'm going to receive the request first. I'm going to just take that over here, and in receive request stage, I'm going to assign a role, right? 
So I could actually drag and drop my roles by clicking over here and having my list. Maybe it's any staff member will receive the request. I actually have it set up so that my roles will show up so it becomes even more visual. So in the receive request, maybe if I were to just go to the bottom half of my screen, I can design what those tasks are. Maybe the request I receive is a phone call or an email. Maybe it's an email request. I could go in there and just change the icon and change it to an email. This is where you could, again, start customizing. So I'm going to go down, find an email. You can see there's quite a bit of options. You can actually limit this if you like. I tend to keep it all open for myself. Um, just makes it easier. Um, just do uh, here, Outlook. So we have a receive email task. Uh, maybe we'll do an, a system task, like look up customer records in whatever system you want to look up. You can change that to, to anything you want. Maybe there's an email response. You can actually use the default there and notice there's a mail there. These are all my t default task I icons that I can shortcut. Maybe this one is just email CM request to lead, right, or something like that. I can go ahead and then just line them up. Notice right now, as I build, one of the intuitive things about the tool that I like is that everything is in red. When it's in red, it's unfinished, and it'll tell you the warning underneath, either there or when you can, you can check your links or your entity as you go. But this is intuitive. So right now, receive request is in red, and I want to finish up this task. Let's just say these three things, they may or may not be accurate at the moment, but let's just say these are what are being done. I have to put a target in there. Maybe it's in the Oracle system or some system like that. Did you notice as I connected these and filled in the, the information, they turned black. Now, when I go to maybe enter the credit memo, let's just say I'm entering it. Notice this one now turns black. So my first stage is complete, I can then go on to the next one. Maybe you also have things like conditions. Let's just say, is this over maybe $500 is the credit limit. If it's over, maybe there is a manager approval. So we'll put that up there and just add it in as we go. Manager approve deny, right? Add that in. So let's just pretend we're going to do that here, right? And if it's over 500, it would go to a manager approval. Otherwise, somebody else could approve and deny in another way with different instructions, right? You can start to see that. One of the things that this can also do is it, where you saw me enter those user notes called descri description and instruction. What I'm going to do here is I'm just going to throw in some instructions, what they need to do. Maybe it's just a simple screenshot. Um, enter the fields below, something like that. And I could go and enter a picture, a screenshot, or what have you. Um, I'm just going to go in here. Oh, here's a nice one of my dog. Maybe they have to do that. So there's a picture in there. Maybe it's a screenshot. So what you do is continue there. I'm going to Fill that out, I'm just going to enter it as a manual task, enter CM in system, something like that, right? Close it up. And you can start to see it builds. Now there's still in red, there's no role assigned. Maybe the person entering the credit memo is actually the credit clerk. Now you can start to see my process is getting built, okay? So one of the things I can do now, I mean, what I'd like to show you is how, what do I do once I'm ready to produce the document? I'm just going to go like this and email the credit memo when it's done. We'll just kind of close it off, show you. It's going to be one of these two things will be completed. I don't necessarily need to put tasks in. As you can see, we have done that example there. And maybe they're going to email the credit memo or approve or deny, or email response, maybe CM is not the right word, but you get the idea that in about 10 minutes I put together a basic few-stage process. 
The interesting thing is now, once you have the process collaborated and you understand who all the players are, um, you could probably add manager over to here and just sort of fill some of those in and maybe this is just the team lead that does that one. Either way, you can change it, modify it as you go. Now, what I can do is I can create output that is unlimited. I have so many different ways I can filter this. I can actually produce the output document relative to the role. So I could create documentation here just for managers, or I could create documentation here just for the folks in finance. It's all very customizable and very easy to do. The, to let you know on this product, so these are questions if you're outsourcing process uh, modeling tools, how fast does it take to learn it and things like that. This tool, um, you can learn it in about a day um, for the very basic level of what I'm showing you here and, um, um, and much more functionality than that. Um, it's about a day training and then another day of just practicing with your processes. So within two days, you would be up and running very, very, very well. In this case, I'm going to now produce documentation in Word or HTML. Those are really the two that I use mostly here. Word helps for when you're onboarding and training and you're, you're testing new processes. It's always great to produce a Word document that you want people to write on. But we tend to keep our approved processes all in HTML format because, I, as, and I will show you in just a few minutes, why we do that and where we make that accessible on, our, on a SharePoint site internally. So what happens is I'm just going to go ahead and say credit request as my model just to give it a unique name. So what happens is when you're done, all you get is a nice HTML output. It's got all of your heading. It has your table of contents. And there's Leo. Um, here is your process here. So if you notice, even by looking at the HTML, when there are notes, when there are things to, to drill down to, you will see that there is a little note option here that tells me there's additional information, which is just this here. Um, also, if you scroll down, you're going to see summaries, all role assignments that are, are based on each. So this stage is performed by all staff, and you can see the steps that are taken. So those are the tasks right there listed as well. And as you continue down, you have your, your role descriptions, then you can go down, and the index is automatically built. This all speaks to any kind of compliance that we have ever, I have ever run into in the past 15 years of working with this tool um, for whether you have SOX compliance, you know, Sarbanes-Oxley, or if it's ISO or Lean Manufacturing, Six Sigma, this will meet your compliance requirements. You have so much flexibility here, but it will produce the documentation that is required. I'm going to um, go back to the process and show you what it would look like. Yes. As you're going back into that, I guess I wanted to just, you know, one of the things that I always like to do or try and do is <clears throat> is kind of tie this to, I mean, I know that you just demonstrated how you can, um, these are the tactical things to build a process yep. inside of this tool, right? Yep. So, yep. And, it, and, and we do like this tool, and I definitely want to um, articulate that it's, uh, it, it, it's made a dramatic change, uh, difference in our business. Um, but but really the the objectives the things that Michael just are, you know was able to do there in a, in a short order and whether or not you're doing that in you know in a word document as a checklist or something yourself um, you know the, I'm sure that those of you listening uh, watching right now as well as that will watch it in the future and will attend Tech Pulse next week that that we we all suffer the same problems right is that we might design something and and we train somebody once on it and then they end up being the trainer and they train somebody else on it and then they train somebody else on it. And you know, I know this happened in our organization that, and then all of a sudden a few years go by, and the original design of that thought and that process and the documentation and the recording and the steps that you're supposed to take and the checks you're supposed to check, uh, the check boxes you're supposed to check, it, it gets convoluted and 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 people it loses and then you have turnover and and so what what part of what Michael's illustrating is and and the, that it's simple to do as well as it helps solve the problem of when you're training people and giving them something to reference and so it's not somebody's nuance of how they interpret the process or how they interpret something it actually gives them step-by-step -step instructions and so and going through the effort and the exercise of, of defining it to this level of granularity of what are the steps you take who's responsible for taking them um, in a consistent way um, is definitely you know I guess where it solves a bunch of those problems that um, and this is one of the ways you can do it obviously is with this tool but it solves a bunch of those problems as far as 
getting documentation consistent, making sure that everyone's following the steps consistently. And I'll tell you, just as a little tip um, for those that are, that are listening in, you know, Michael referenced ISO and he referenced, uh, you know, that you could, you could get into other regulatories where there's specific processes or specific steps you're supposed to take, is that when you train people on this, this is something that we do, and this is a little tip that if you're not doing something like this, it's, it's an easy thing to do, is when you, when you train someone on a process, we give them the opportunity to ask questions, understand, and, and make sure that they're in alignment with it. And then we actually have them sign a little piece of paper. Now, this is kind of an HR thing, but this helps reinforce the message. I was going to get to that, yeah. <laughs> okay, so yeah. Th this is, these are just, I'm, I'm just trying to make sure that I, I wanted to frame the tactics that you're going through relative to the typical problems that, that I know everyone has relative to their team executing things consistently. And that this is one of the ways in which you can do it, but... but but, you know, so just to go back to, we have them sign a little piece of paper that says, I have been trained on this process and I agree to follow it, right? And so you as a manager or leader or supervisor uh, uh, or team member have, the, have the, now the, the, the information, now have proof to hold everyone around you compatible, you know? So it also applies to people that might not pull their weight or they don't do all the steps they're supposed to take and then they hand it off to the next person and the next person's irritated because you know, the person behind them didn't actually do their job. And now that person, you've enabled your team to be able to, um, uh, to execute on those, on those steps so, and, and be able to hold each other accountable. So I was trying to also give you a little bit of a transition there, Michael, um, but also to tee it up from a standpoint of uh, that, that all of this stuff is relative to just think of the problems that you have when you train your team and over time, how that message gets diluted, and as you add people to your team, or there's turnover to your team, or as people change roles, like having this kind of a documentation, whether it's Excel or some other tool you use, um, it solves a lot of those problems. And so those are the things I want you to be thinking about, everyone, uh, it, whether you're listening to it now or, or, or in the future, um, as Michael goes through the details. So. Um, forgive me for interjecting there, Michael, but you know I was. No, I, I, I don't mind at all. That's that's great feedback, and in fact, the and, and part of the reason why I like to get into the detail that I do with demonstrating the tool is so that if any of you are out shopping, at least if I can provide you a little bit more deeper insight into what a process modeling tool should do, at least you might help you ask the right questions. Because the whole point of what I'm showing you is actually um, when I'm done here, we're going to go to where we hold people accountable and those forms and so forth. I need to do a little change there on the diagram, but this is the Word document that comes out. It looks basically the same as the um, HTML, but it's useful if you want to publish it that way. I tend to use that more in training at anyhow, but let me get back to where we, um, where we actually live and breathe with these processes, and I'll show you where that form is as well. So within, within that, I'm going to pull up our our SharePoint site. So that document output that you saw in HTML, which is this one, right? All of our documentation lives here on SharePoint that I, I'll man I manage this site and I also use a change request process and that speaks to our ITIL strategy. Um, when a process has been approved, these are version numbers, V2, V3, V4, uh, v6 so you can see that we have overhauled these processes numerous times to get them where they are today but they are still living and breathing and that by, by nature of our change requests we can continue to engage um, what we have done for these process you can see here we've taken care of we have not taken care of we are engaged so I want to correct Nate on his on the engagement that we have people sign, it doesn't say I will follow this process, it says I am fully engaged with this process. That means as if I have a role in this process, it is my responsibility to ensure I am compliant, but if I need to change it, I will enact a change request so that we have a conversation, i.e. a discovery around it so that we can come up with a, a, an improvement or, or not. Sometimes a, a change request may not be approved. So we have a process to make sure that we, we dot our I's and cross our T's, so to speak. Now, in our process change um, request, anytime there's a change to a process, if we go to a new version, we go and have our users sign a compliance form. And I believe it's in this folder here. We have started using our... Um, our SharePoint site as a repository for all of our templates and our documents. 
Now, what I'm going to do is show you the Rubik's Cube output um, as far as just what it would look like online, right? So I've created this how to solve the cube. This is going to be the way to continue to bring on new hires and show them how to read our process documentation. So really what they need to do is just follow the steps understanding the components so how is the Rubik's Cube broken down so I've placed some pictures in there to understand you're going to be um, working with left front and right face of the cube and then you're going to solve by top middle and bottom layers this is your first step you're going to find a green edge piece and you're going to based on whatever answer you answer here you're going to go ahead and follow the steps to to get your success now, it's a great way to, to engage, and then the whole point is that if a user is able to follow this process, he'll be able to follow any of our processes, whether it's the credit request process or, or this. What, uh, the form that Nathan was talking about, I'll just go into new process design. Um, we have a form that within our processes, we have all of our links as well. So the compliance form that I have users sign when they are, uh, so here we go. Here we go. It's really a simple um, form, but it makes people sign off on it, and it it does make a difference. This is about accountability. Now it's in. It's kind of formatted funny I'm on a terminal server, but really this is the statement I want people to, um, to understand. There it says, I am engaged in this process and will note any potential improvements, manage exceptions by humanizing the experience. That's one of our own internal mantras where, yes, we have processes, but we do not blindly follow our processes. We are engaged with them to the point of success. But if something comes out, if there's an exception that comes in, whoever owns the exception at the time, it's realized it's an exception. It is their job to humanize it, own it, and bring it to fruition. And then we talk about how it was impacted by the process and what we may need to do to improve. So it's always the customer first. Um, so that's that form there that uh, we require people to sign when we engage them in the process. Uh, let's go back. One of the other things I'd like to show you on this site, and again, this is about keeping them available and where everyone's accountable through the engagement form and constant deployment of changes. Part of this is not only do our staff have the ability to, um, you know, if we were going to onboard a new hire, for example, you know, go through the process and see what, what needs to be done uh, for the new hire, and that's fine. They have the ability to go through it manually that way. I am now developing videos um, of screenshots, just uh, instructional videos that do exactly the same thing, but we're marrying them up to the process so that people, if they want to watch a video to learn the process, they can watch a video. As well as um, my work in progress, we are now delving into our um, our deliverables, our executables within service. How are we how are we obtaining our configuration data, and how is our help desk using that data for servicing our clients? So we've gotten all of these supporting processes done, um, and they're engaged, and we're constantly improving those, but let's continue to work on, now we're talking all of our service delivery. How are our projects being executed? How, are our, how fast is our help desk meeting their SLAs and so forth? So this is just also constantly evolving so that we can better provide that best IT experience uh, for customers in North America. Um, <clears throat> I think that, that brings my demonstration to, to an end. Um, I'm always happy to talk about process in, uh, to anyone. Uh, if you ever want to chat with me, if you want me to come and talk to your organization, come see me at Tech Pulse. I am going to be doing a little, more, uh, little bit more something fun with the Rubik's Cube, and I think people will enjoy that. Um, but we will be covering um, just the strategy and the methodology therein. Nathan, I think I've gone through. Yeah, that's it. I think, um, I, I, you know, one of the things I think, um, just as a, a commentary, um, you know, in your experience, and I, I know that we at MyTech probably haven't gotten to, to some of this, but have you, have you, what are some of the measurables that you, uh, you, you've dealt with, you know, as far as saying, all right, it used to take us, like, actually, I think there is one. Um, we worked on the, the product order management process where um, one of the things we had, um, uh, we would uh, a customer would order a PC or a laptop or a printer or something like that, and 
and um, we ended up getting a lot of um, calls because we weren't we as an organization weren't doing a good job of proactively communicating to the customer of the status of the order um, and so uh, you know we did like this we did the idea of a pizza tracker if you order a pizza online you kind of get this this notification of where it's at it's just you know the toppings are being put on the uh, um, the uh, you know the next step is it's being put in the oven it's, it's baking now it's being prepped for delivery now it's being delivered um, so I know Mike I see you going through that but I'm um, looking for it, yeah. Like, yeah, so, so like one of the things that there are measurable things you can look around this, and I, this is the first one that came to mind, is we, we wanted to not, if, if we felt that if a customer was calling us about a question um, that, that we weren't doing, we, we weren't communicating proactively enough, right? So, so uh, here you go. So, so this one is, is an example of like an ROI, I guess, that I wanted to just articulate is that um, and, and, and you said how many inbound calls, and I guess I don't, I don't think we, and, and correct me if I'm wrong here, Michael, but I don't think we statistically said, all right, we're getting 10 calls a week or something like that, and now that's down to two. Um, yeah, I think we, you're right. The, one of the, the dialogue we had in our initial discoveries was, you know, what is the goal of putting this process together? And yes, you're right, it was to reduce the number of calls and reduce errors and communicate proactively to the customer. So this client tracker notification serves that in two purposes. It does communicate proactively and it, it did reduce calls. We haven't, we, we have only gotten the subjective feedback saying that people are happier because they're not taking the calls, but we didn't have a, a number we were shooting for. We were looking for employee satisfaction on not being interrupted because they didn't need to be make, answering these calls because we've already told the customer. Well, and it was right, and it was and it was a problem that we were we were our customers were frustrated. So it was a customer happiness issue too. Absolutely, um, that was really was really driving that because you know it, it, there was a lot of back and forth going on, and 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 customers felt frustrated that they were having to take time out of their day to call us and and at, get questions when they felt we should. So it was a yes, we wanted to make sure to enable our 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 team to serve our customers, um, but not have to reserve them. Uh, after something that has already been handled, so that they, but but yet keep the keep them informed and give them tools of which they could access the information or have the information regularly. So this, this I guess I wanted to tangibly break that down in a summary to everyone and, and saying thank you for participating today because you know process isn't just for the sake of process. I mean it it is to have not only consistency on how it's executed, but it has a real tangible result to improving the way you interact with your internal team or improving the way you interact with your customers. And um, I know that this this was this one right here was actually I think the first, if not one of the first processes, um, other than our process that defined how we update our process. Yeah. <laughs> um, but but I think that was the first one. But but this is the first process that we executed because this is where we were experiencing some pain. Our yeah. customers were frustrated. Our team was was spending time um, re-communicating information when they could have been working with other customers and, and giving a better experience to those other folks. So um, in a simple way. Uh, we increase communication um, and increase our our team's ability to serve other customers, um, and, and and in the end, you know, hopefully, made our customers happier. So um, there are tangible goals that could and should be set, um, and sometimes it's a anecdotal thing. I know our inside team says like the customer volume from those kind of calls is is way down um, compared to what it used to be, and um, and uh, I, I believe that our customers are happier because they're getting this information on a regular basis consistently. So um, with that said, Michael, any final thoughts? No, nope, just happy to talk process. Anybody that wants to give me a call. <laughs> all right. Well, great. Well, I think you all can tell Michael is very passionate about this. He's a very knowledgeable and experienced person in this regard. We're lucky to have him on our team. Um, if you are a Tech Pulse, by all means, stop by next week and say hi. Um, and uh, if anyone would like to uh, connect with Michael afterwards and talk process, by all means, let shoot me an email or you have his contact information there as well. Um, thank you all very much for attending this month's edition of My Tech U, where we uh, talked about how a Rubik's Cube can actually help improve your business. So thanks a lot, everyone, and have a great day. Bye. Thank you.